So there is only one God. There is only one Jesus Christ. There is only one Holy Spirit. There was only one Joseph. There was only one Moses in the bulrushes. There was only one David, king and the psalmist. There was only one Mary, the mother of Jesus. There is only one you. And that is what I felt God wanted to break open in our hearts first of all, is that these are people's names. I'm not talking about thousands. I'm not talking about millions. I'm talking about people's names this morning. And you matter. There is a purpose and a calling for you, your life, wherever you find yourself right now, your age, your job, whatever you are doing right now, there is a purpose and a calling for you. God hasn't given up on you, and he never will. But what I do want you to know is that Satan has a plan for your life too. A few weeks ago, churches across the world were celebrating Easter, Easter weekend, that weekend where we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. We remember that what he went through, the betrayal, that he died on the cross for our sins so that we can live for eternity with him. There was one man who betrayed Jesus. It didn't take thousands. It didn't take a hundred. It didn't take ten. It took one man, Judas Iscariot. And today, when I told Greg I wanted to preach on Judas, he shook his head and said, why? <laughs> but I really felt like there were parts of Judas that I could relate to at certain stages of my life. Judas Iscariot was part of the chosen team. Anyone not been chosen for that sports team? You know when they're calling out the names and your name was 13 and they stopped at 12? <laughs> Judas Iscariot was part of the team. He was part of the A team. He was part of the chosen team. Judas Iscariot was there when Jesus turned the water into wine, when he walked on the water with Peter, when he spoke to the woman at the well. Judas Iscariot saw Jesus cast demons out of people. He saw Jesus raise people from the dead. He saw Jesus bring money out of a fish's mouth. He saw Jesus multiply the bread and the fish. He saw the miracles of Jesus. He knew Jesus. He knew Jesus' favorite coat that he wore, or his favorite sandal, whether they were beige or black, perhaps. I don't know. He knew what Jesus liked to drink. He knew what Jesus smelled like. He knew his tone of voice. We don't know his tone of voice. He, Judas knew Jesus. So why did Judas betray Jesus? That's the question today. Let's read in Matthew 26. I've got some water here. So my Bible is the Life Application Bible. I love it because it just seems to make sense to me. I'm just a mom. <laughs> I don't have theological degrees, and I hope you're not disappointed by that. But what I can say is that have, I've had a relationship with Jesus for more than 20 years. I've fallen in love with him. He is my everything and my all. So I am passionately in love with Jesus today, and that is what I hope you get out of this. So Judas Iscariot, and from verse 14, one of the 12 apostles went to the chief priest and asked, how much will you pay me to get Jesus into your hands? And they gave him 30 silver coins. 30 silver coins you could buy a slave with. And from that time on, Judas watched for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them. So I want you to know that God has a beautiful plan for your life, but so does Satan. I had a picture of a man walking with Jesus, and he had this bag of money with him the whole time. And everything that Jesus did and everything Jesus said and spoke, he was looking for the opportunity to betray Jesus. And I remember a time in my life where no matter what was going on, no matter the testimonies, the worship, the preaching, the miracles, I felt like I had a mist over me. I felt like I had a doubt in my heart. And whenever someone would say, you believe in the Bible, you believe in Jesus, or, or they would give some other theory, I felt like I doubted. I felt like, I was like, yeah, it does sound a bit stupid. <laughs> it, yeah, I don't know why I believe that actually. And I found that there was a season where I was just the same as Judas, is that I was walking around with Jesus, yet I had 
in my heart. I don't know if you're true. I don't know if I can trust you. I remember there was one moment in my life that was a defining moment for me. See, I lived a life growing up in church. I met Jesus on a few occasions. I heard of him for many years. But there was one moment when I was in that moment of doubting, and somebody said to me, and it's a man I'm actually married to, (laughs) he said to me, Shannon, your relationship with God is up to you. It's not up to your pastor. It's not up to your youth leader. It's not up to your spouse. It's not up to your kids. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is up to you. How far you want to take it is up to you. How much you want to love him is up to you. How much you want to give him is up to you. And I realized one of my favorite scriptures is of a woman who comes to Jesus. There's two moments, two women that do it. And the one woman takes that alabaster jar and she pours it on Jesus' feet out of thankfulness, out of giving her all. And in that moment, if you remember, Judas looked on that moment and said, that is such a waste. We could have used that money for the poor. Yes, he was right. But Jesus knew his heart. And he said to him that you'll always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me. Knowing Judas's heart was that he actually wanted that money to be spent on him. But there's another moment where Jesus is sitting at a Pharisee's house. He's been invited for supper, and he's sitting at the table, and a woman knows that Jesus is sitting there for a meal. And she goes up to to Jesus. She actually goes from behind, and it was said that she was a woman of many sins. She goes up behind Jesus, and I always get choked up when I think of this, but She bends down from behind, around his feet, and they say that the tears on her face wet Jesus' feet. And she took her hair, and she washed his feet with her hair, and she kissed his feet. And then she took that expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet. And the Pharisee thought to himself, if Jesus was this prophetic man that he says he is, he would know that this is a woman with many sins. Why is he allowing her to touch him? And Jesus, knowing this man's thoughts, he said to him, I want to tell you a story. There was two men that owed money. One owed 50 denarii and one owed 500. But the money lender said to both of them, because they couldn't pay him back, that both of you, your debt is cleared. And Jesus said to the Pharisee, so which one do you think was more grateful? And so the Pharisee answered back, obviously the man who had been forgiven much, the man who owed more, and that was let off. And Jesus said to him, it is exactly the same in the kingdom, is that those that are forgiven much love much, and those that are forgiven little love little. And I wondered to myself, maybe Judas was that, is that he was a man who, yes, he had sin. Yes, he, he, he knew maybe he had an issue with money because he had this doubt in his mind the whole time. Maybe Judas was that person who didn't love much. And so he didn't realize how much he needed Jesus. You know, Jesus died on the cross for my sins, even if it was a little bit. He still paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Whether you sit here today and you are the, the man and woman who have a multitude of sins, or you sit here today and you've been in church your whole life and you only have a few. Jesus still paid the ultimate price for your sin. And that's why there are names here today. That you're not just a group of people, but your names matter. Who you are matters to God. Because he knows that just as Judas was a man who knew Jesus, but didn't surrender his life to Jesus Christ, so can we be. We can be that man who knows Jesus Christ. We've seen the testimonies. We've heard the miracles. We know him, but have we surrendered our hearts to Jesus Christ? Jesus, in that moment when he met with that woman and the Pharisee, who did he call out the sins of? He called out the sins 
not of the woman who had sinned much, but he had called out the sins of the man who was righteous, of the man who, had, who felt he was sitting there judging the woman with him. And I believe this is an account of how we respond to Jesus entering our lives. Jesus said to him, you did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. Verse 46, you did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. You see, you are everything. You are everything, yet you are nothing. (laughs) Some of the things I've, I've realized through my relationship with Jesus is that to be great in this kingdom, you need to be crushed. Everyone in? To know God more and more means you need to go through dark, deep, alone, suffocating valleys with him. You know that seed when it's under the ground? Ever feel like that in your life where you just feel like the pressure is on you and you feel like you're suffocating? Those are the moments that bring out the gold in us. To bear fruit, there is a dying to self-needs your wants, your ambitions, your desires, your opinions, your dislikes and likes. Still all in? (laughs) Lastly, to have a fire burn deep in your bones and your heart. You are tested time and time again on the convictions on which you live. The other day when I was singing, I was just, uh, I shared that story about when I was younger there was that song about being a Jesus freak. It was by DC Talk, and they said, what will people know when they find out it's true? What will people do when they find out that I'm a Jesus freak? And for a long time in my life, I used to know that I wanted more of Jesus. I used to desire to be on fire and, passion, and, and just passionate for Jesus. But I had, I had these people in my mind, and... It can be family members. It can be the person that sits next to you, the person that was in school with you. You have those people in your mind that keep thinking, but what will they think of me? What will they think of me when I am that Jesus freak? When they do see that there's something weird about me. (laughs) And I felt like there was that call of where we were Jesus freaks and there was that community. And then somewhere along the line, we became just like the world. We looked like the world. We lived like the world. We did as the world did. And on the side, we'd say, Jesus is in our lives. And I felt like there was a call again to this generation. Let's be those Jesus freaks again. Let, let it not worry us of what people think about us, the people at your work, the people at your home, your unsaved brothers and sisters. Because honestly, time is ticking out. And I don't want to get to the end of my life and suddenly have this revelation and it's too late because my sphere of influence will shrink. (laughs) I want my kids to see that, Mom, I can be a good mom or I can be a great mom because I'm not going to show them to me. I'm going to show them to him. You can be a good dad or you can be a great dad. You can be a good business owner or you can be a great business owner. You can be a good granny, or you can be a great granny. (laughs) It's when we stop the focus onto ourselves and put the focus onto Jesus Christ. So I was sharing sharing about the worship and the Jesus freak, and and Thursday night at prayer meeting, I was just thinking that day, oh my gosh, shush, Shannon, you shouldn't be talking about that. Stop that whole thing, because it's just going to put people off Jesus. And a young boy shared, you know, that moment when you shared about being a Jesus freak, something hit my heart, and and I've got an idea of what I want to do with that thing of being a Jesus freak for the youth. I was like, thank you, Jesus, (laughs) because there is a fire starting. And I know you're sitting here today, you've, you've taken the time out to come to church. You've taken the risk of coming out around people today. Don't leave this place the same person who walked in here whether you are a Christian or not, or whether it's your first time here, don't leave this building the same person. Let that fire be in your bones. Don't let the hardship and the crushing 
that you've been through in your life be for nothing. Don't give up on Jesus. I want to talk a little bit about what happens with Judas. I don't know if you can follow on the screen because I've just clipped all the things with, Ju with Judas into one. Okay. Mamela. <laughs> While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests to the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. He said to them that the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Early in the morning, this is we're skipping a bit, so early in the morning, all the chief priests and elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. I don't think Judas realized that this was going to go that far. So they bound him, led him away, handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver. We can be remorseful of our sins without even knowing Jesus in our hearts. But do you see what I see? Who did Judas go back to? Who did he turn to when he was filled with remorse? He turned back to man. And he said to the men that I have sinned. And what did they do? Like all men do. Not my responsibility, it's your responsibility. And so in that moment of him repenting in a way, but to the wrong person, what happens? He walks away with his guilt and sin and shame on him still. Guys, if we don't repent and come to the Father, Jesus Christ, we will not get the freedom from our sins. There is no man and no thing that you can do to take off the weight. There is no good deeds you can do to cancel the weight of the sin in your life. So Judas tried to, to give back the money. There was no freedom in that. He said, I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. He repented to man, and there was still no freedom in that. And Judas walks away and makes an end to his own problems. And sometimes we try and fix kingdom problems with our worldly solutions. You sit here today and you've got problems in your life. There is no solution other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to give you the answer to your worldly problems. Let the king sort out your worldly problems. I wonder if Judas had remembered that story about the man who had been forgiven much, the woman who had been for, the man who had been forgiven much, that he, that he would be so much more thankful. If he had in that moment seen, my sins, Jesus Christ, what have I done to you? Forgive me of my sins. He would have been just like the one who was forgiven much. And then he would have loved much. Because he would have felt the freedom and the weight being lifted off of him from his sins. Judas never got it. He never let Jesus deliver him from the guilt and the weight. You see, this betrayal cost Judas everything, actually, as well. The only people it didn't cost was the religious. And that's exactly what happens, is that when we become a religious people, we forget the cost involved in what Jesus did for us. And we live good, good lives. And we judge, judge, judge. But we never let the king and his kingdom affect our hearts. Our purpose on this life is not to live for our own wills and desires. It's to die to that and live for this King Jesus Christ. There is a hope for our generation. You know, in Ezekiel, where he speaks of that prophetic picture of the dry bones. You can read it. Um, he speaks about this picture of dry bones in a valley. And God says to him, 
that these dry bones are like my people, the Israelites. Do you know why they were dry bones? It says because they had lost hope. And sometimes we can come to church time and time again, or we can try and make our lives right, but we've lost the hope inside of us for something good, for something new, for something deeper. And God, I felt, wanted to restore the hope in our lives again. And so the picture comes where the, the bones start rattling and the tendons come and the flesh comes and the meat comes and the skin comes and there is this body. But the problem was is that this body still didn't have the breath in it. You know, when you do not have Jesus Christ as Lord and King of your life, you're a body, but you don't have the breath in you. You don't have that Holy Spirit. Jesus died on the cross and what did he, who did he leave with us? The Holy Spirit. And he is with each one of us. He is our comforter. He is our God. He is our, our friend. And so the, the life was breathed into these bones. And hope was restored. I'm ending now. Uh, uh, keyboard, Colleen, are you around? <laughs> Blessing. Such an awesome worship team. Jesus might not have said to Judas, here is 30 silver coins. You know, if Judas had gone to Jesus and said, look, I can get 30 silver coins, what can you give me? <laughs> he knew Jesus would not have answered with, okay, you can get 30, I'll give you 31. He knew Jesus would not have answered that because it's not about the money for Judas. It's not about our, 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 your outward sins. It's got nothing to do with those things was not about the money for Judas. It was about the heart. Surrender your heart and not your garments. God is not interested in our outward works. He's not interested if you raised your hand this morning in worship, if it was done out of a garment heart. <laughs> God wants our hearts. He's not interested in our garments. Money runs out, friends leave, love wanes, and your youthfulness in your body is ticking away. But as hope is restored to you, ask yourself again, what is my purpose? And let's love Jesus with that crazy love again. Have that crazy look in your eye again. <laughs> your, your past does not matter and it is not going to affect your future because when you come to know Jesus Christ he lifts off the burdens of your sins like nothing else in this world will do and then your, your sins through, think of Joyce Myers she shares a dark secret of her life where her father sexually abused her she brought her whole family into the life there she's got aunts, uncles, brothers grannies, grandpas other sisters. She brought her whole family into the light there in her vulnerability. She didn't lose her purpose. She didn't lose her hope. She didn't lose her calling. So honestly, there is nothing in our lives that can disqualify us from remembering the purpose and the calling in our lives. That you are called to love Jesus with that crazy love again. Let that hope be restored in you, no matter your age, your gender, your status. Can we stand? I'm done. <laughs>